Interestingly, it was the anti-federalists, the post-revolutionary America, who were in favor of paper currency. Usually it's the federalists who oppose hard currency in order to foot the bills for the new government. In this case, the anti-federalists were landowners who favored paper in order to pay off their own... Ah, deliverance, it would seem, is at hand. We'll pick this up on Monday. Remember, midterm essays are due on the 29th. Any topic, but it must be a contemporary issue. In other words, don't bother to shell out 10 bucks for warmed over papers on the black market. Well, since this is Harvard, perhaps I should say the gray market. Dr. Fitzgerald? Yes, Mr. Rose. Since you did say any topic, I thought I might do my 1,500 words on President Kennedy's speech tomorrow. Speech? Yes, sir, in Dallas, at the trademark. It's being carried on live radio, and I thought I might do an analysis on it. If that's okay with you, sir. Yes, Mr. Rosen, that would be fine. You go right ahead. Well, that's a splendid paper, Joe, in the New Heritage. I can't say I agree with all your conclusions, but uh, you're always a delight to read. Thank you, Paul. Nice of you to say so. I wasn't expecting you for another month. Well, this isn't a formal status report. It's a... just a friendly visit. I wondered how you were doing. After all, it's been almost, uh, two whole hours <laughs> since my last visit. Strange. You spend months, sometimes years at a time, back here in the past, separated from your family. But when you get back to them, it's only a few hours. I'll never get used to it. It's equally hard to leave the past behind. It's hard to give up a whole second life that you've created for yourself. You've made friends, probably fell in love. Not me. Hmm. How can you get close to people when you can't really tell them what you think? When you can't say that your favorite flavor of ice cream, for God's sake, won't be invented for the next 150 years. Sometimes I feel like an eternal observer. Doomed always to watch, never to participate. Always detached, always remote. Every field historian goes through this, sometime or another. I know, but it's just so damn frustrating. I spent three years studying John Kennedy and his times. I even met him at a reception for McGeorge Bundy. But I never really got to know him. You have a Chinese view of ancestor worship. Kate. I did not create this project just because this man was an ancestor of mine. These are arguably some of the most turbulent times America ever saw. You don't have to go to Dallas tomorrow. You know that? Kate, this is my project. I got the funding. I'm the one who spent the last three years here. I'll see this through to the end. It's just that... I never really got to know him. And now I've got to go watch him. Ken, what's that? It's family keepsake. It's a good luck charm. <sighs> Dated one year after your destination. Against policy. But not strictly enforced. Kate, give me a break, please. Let me have my own particular form of uh, ancestor worship. Well, have a safe trip to Dallas, Joseph. Sai Jen, Lao Pung Yao, Sai Jen. What'd you say? 
Well, guess I'll ask you about that in 200 years. Might as well get this over with. Computer scanning. Systems check. Holographic recorder operational. Operational. Emergency homing device. Operational. Third ring become separated from temporal risk controls. Wearer of ring will be automatically returned to point of departure. Two, one, seven, two, eight D. Sam Hill, did you come from? Cambridge. Treasury 2, over and out. Looks like Mr. Rosen will get to do his essay after all. Pardon me? Nothing. I uh, check out as an upstanding citizen. And then some. You didn't tell me you knew Secretary of Defense McNamara. I don't really. I met him once or twice in Harvard functions. That's all. Seems he's a big fan of yours. Admired some article you wrote, uh, applying mathematical games theory to historical analysis. You were in Dallas to hear the president's speech, I take it? Yes, and record him for my class at Harvard. This baby must have some telephoto lens on it for you to have seen a gunman from that distance, hmm? Actually, no. All I saw was a glint of sun on metal. I guess I panicked. It's been lucky you did. Otherwise, this country might be in mourning right now. I hope you don't mind my asking, uh, Mr. Livingston, but... Exactly where are we going? You met the president before, Professor? Only in passing. Well, he recognized your name. He wanted to meet with you after his speech. He's cutting short his trip to Texas. Everyone's fairly rattled by the shooting. We're scheduled to rendezvous with him at Love Field in about 20 minutes. Governor, thank you very much. See you again. Mr. President. I believe you've met Dr. Joseph Fitzgerald. This is the man who saved your life this morning. Dr. Fitzgerald, oh. Harvard and I are in your debt. The honest mind, Mr. President. I've been wanting to meet you for some time now, although I hadn't anticipated the circumstances. Bob McNamara showed me some of your articles. Very good. Mr. President, I'm afraid I won't be heading back just yet. The damnedest thing, a couple of the meanest looking tornadoes you ever saw just blew into the state. One of them just ripped right through downtown Austin. The other one's headed here. 
I uh, better stay and see what I can do. Yeah. Tornadoes? Yes, yeah. sir. Take care of your people, Linden. Let me know how I can help. Yes, sir. All right, come along, Professor. Even I can't keep the Air Force waiting all day. Come along uh, to Washington? We'd be honored to have you as a guest for dinner tonight at the White House. Tomorrow morning, we can have you on a plane back to Cambridge, if you like. I, uh, I'd love to. Mr. President, thank you. Oh, uh, Jack. Men who saved my life call me Jack. What are you thinking about? Strange feeling. Being shot at. In the war, it was different. Impersonal. They weren't shooting at you, really. Just the uniform. Maybe whoever shot at you wasn't shooting at you, but the office you represent. That may be. But nobody ever shot at Eisenhower. <laughs> <laughs> you sure you know relation to old Honey Fitz, my grandfather? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. It's too bad. According to the press, if you had been a relative, there might have been a place for you in my cabinet. <laughs> you like fencing with the press, don't you? Oh, uh, you take your fun where you can. God knows there's little enough of it in the job itself. When you're campaigning, it's easy enough to get caught up in the excitement of it all. Politics, easy to convince yourself that it's all a game, an invigorating game. But days like today, you know damn well it's not a game. Days like today, days like April 17th, 1961, Bay of Pigs. Damn stupid idea. I should never have gone along with it. Never. Suddenly, I wasn't just politicking. I was responsible for men's lives. It was like having my PT boat sunk again, only this time. This time, I couldn't do anything to save them. You know, my father drummed into us when we were growing up that you needed power to get anything done. Power. But after Berlin, in the middle of crisis, I don't know. No one man should have that much power. No one man should have to have it. You are way ahead of your time. It will take... <laughs> it will probably take another century before people see it that way. If people see it a hundred years from now, it will have been worth the wait. Excuse me, Mr. President. There's a radio phone call for you from Defense Secretary McNamara. Excuse me. Oh, and uh, Dallas police called. They captured a man named Lee Oswald. They're charging him with attempted murder. He's the one who fired him. Based our strategic forces on yellow alert. I want you to set up an emergency cabinet meeting for tonight at 7. Rusk is on a plane to Japan. See if you can get him back. I want Taylor, Bundy, and Sorensen. Yeah, and Bobby. Is it anything you can tell me about? Well, it's nothing that won't be on Huntley Brinkley in about an hour and a half, unfortunately. Russian troops just captured West Berlin. Soviet Premier is demanding that we pull our forces out of the rest of Germany, holding West Berlin as hostage. But, uh, but Khrushchev would never do that. Premier Khrushchev was assassinated today. Oh, and uh, Joe, we're going to have to give you a rain check on that dinner. Feel free to stay the night. In fact, I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist on it. Security precaution. Oh, yes, uh, Mr. President, I understand. So there'll be a full staff meeting in one Oh, my camera. Where's my camera? Not in the car? I must have left it on Air Force One. Don't worry, Mr. Fitzgerald. We'll have it delivered to you before you leave. Yes, of course. Fine, Mr. Livingston. Excuse uh, me. Thank you very much. Initial effect of intervention in Kennedy assassination. Time distortion caused by interference in history. Subsequent pressure release by tornadoes at intervention site. Insufficient to counterbalance temporal damage. Compute to the extent of damage in the time stream. Massive tears in the fabric of time. Temporal rift of unprecedented proportions. Temporary stabilization achieved by Khrushchev assassination. Long range projection. 
Continued temporal distortion, increasing geometrically the longer this timeline remains in existence. Give me the worst and the best case outcomes in this timeline with assigned probabilities. Worst case scenario, nuclear exchange between the superpowers results in total annihilation of biosphere. Probability, 77%. Best case scenario, surrender of Western Europe within six years. Military costs collapse Soviet economy. Soviets blackmail West for food, culminating in agrobacterial war. Result, total annihilation of biosphere within century. Probability, 12% mean there's only 11 percent possibility of avoiding total war in this timeline zero percent 11 percent includes all other scenarios leading to total, total annihilation, annihilation of biosphere. Of biosphere since this timeline's not viable give me all options for repairing the original timeline there exists only one viable option the Kennedy presidency must end as history originally recorded. Oh, dear God. What have I done? Yes, General, what is it? Sir, one of our NATO B-52s en route to Berlin is under attack by Soviet MiGs. The pilot is requesting permission to return fire. What shall we tell him, sir? Mr. President? Yes, General. Sir, what are your orders? Tell the pilot to defend himself. Yes, Mr. President. God bless you, sir. God bless us all, General. Remarkable. In my years with the Treasury, I've never seen a counterfeit this faithful of men's standards. Whoever did that is an artist. Then it is a counterfeit. It's not something our mint has in the works for next year? No, of course not. But how could it be? Other countries stamp reigning sovereigns on their coins, but it's against U.S. policy to mint the image of any living person. Could it be a practical joke of some sort, um, or a prototype of a campaign handout? Maybe one of the president's brothers, or, or the Republicans? I doubt it. I mean, they'd have to know that it was a felony. Oh, what about this Fitzgerald? You're sure his credentials are solid, huh? Maybe a little too pat. All of his papers are in all the right places, but I can't find anybody that knows him or knew him before he started teaching at Harvard. That's too damn convenient. He's Johnny on the spot to save the president's life. He loses a coin that shouldn't exist. He, he's got three of the president's family names. Well, he, he even looks like he could be a relative, for God's sakes. And with a crisis coming on that's possibly more dangerous than Cuba, the president's confiding in a stranger like he's a long-lost brother. If you ask me, this Dr. Fitzgerald could very easily be a Soviet sleeper. Ray, I find that hard to believe. Sir, I can't think of a better way to get an agent closer to the president than to set up an assassination attempt and have your man save the president's life. Hey, well, what about this coin? Now, what Russian agent carries around a patently phony and illegal coin and then loses it aboard Air Force One, for God's sake? Then there's the camera. Well, what about it? I got one just like it for Christmas last year. With all respect, sir, I don't think you did. I've had metallurgists at defense going over it all night long. Not only can't they take it apart, they can't even open it up. It's made of some sort of weird alloy they've never even seen before. It's harder than steel. It's impervious to x-rays. It's like nothing we have in development. Uh, get Fitzgerald in here now. Uh, Joe, I'll be brief about this. This coin. Where'd you get it? Mr. President, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Oh, after the events of the last 24 hours, Professor, I think I might believe almost anything. Damn it, Joe, I don't have time for mysteries. I've got a B-52 over East Germany I haven't heard from in three hours. And thousands of Americans at risk in West Berlin. The Russians won't answer the hotline. I may be looking at another Cuba, so cut the crap and tell me where you got the bloody coin. It's, uh, been in my family for over 200 years. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, I'm afraid uh, that answer does strain my credulity. Easy, Professor. This is not a weapon, I assure you.
I'm a historian, Mr. President. Sent here from over 200 years in your future to record and observe the events of your era. If you like, I can show you some holographic tapes of other eras, other time periods. I, uh, I don't think that'll be necessary. Oh, God help me, I think I believe him. Mr. President, I believe Secret Service rules prohibit an agent from drinking while on duty. Ah, uh, permission granted to go off duty. They're for all of us, Ray. We are related, aren't we? You're uh, one of my descendants. Yes, I am. To your health. All right. You're from the future. Why did you choose this moment to make contact with me just now? To, to observe how I would uh, react to this Berlin crisis? No. I... I didn't know about that. You didn't know? <laughs> how could you not know? 1964. Oh, my God. You came to Dallas to witness an assassination, didn't you? Dear God in heaven. Khrushchev, the Soviet invasion, none of this was supposed to happen, was it? The fabric of time has been bent, distorted beyond its normal shape. And this Berlin crisis would would be the end of the world, wouldn't it? Is there any way to, to undo the damage? Yes. <laughs> I have to go back, don't I? Mr. President, you can't. Joe, you'll do this for me. <laughs> we, we Kennedys. Always solve our problems within the family. <laughs> Joe, if the family goes on. Oh, yes. And more than that. In my future, we have seen the realization of your greatest dreams. We have eliminated tyranny, war, poverty. And we've moved out among the stars. Due in large part to that first step you made back in 1961. Thank you for telling me that, Joe. I, I see no point in putting this off. If, uh, if there's anyone you'd like to say goodbye to... I wouldn't be able to leave them if I did. And they wouldn't remember anyway, would they? Hey, what do you want me to do? Put this. Put this on. Mr. President, let me. Ray, it's my boat. What's going on? You took an oath, didn't you, to protect the president's life? Well, you and I still have work to do. We're going back. But before that, I need to make a few changes.
Something wrong, Doctor? Wrong? No. Nothing wrong. At all. Just release the body. Dr. Fitzgerald wasn't the only one with a second life in the past. You, you, you people knew what was going to happen? Some of us drew our research in the even farther future. Dr. Fitzgerald never knew his destiny. No man or woman ever does. What about me? Couldn't my memories change the future somehow? No one can change history. Even the act of traveling in time is a part of history. Dr. Fitzgerald's actions were simply a part of what was. So your memories won't change the future. Because they didn't. Last time I saw him, I couldn't tell him what I knew. All I could say was something in Chinese, a phrase my husband taught me. Sai Jen, Lao Pung Yo, Sai Jen. Goodbye, old friend. Goodbye. History records many facts, some of them right, some of them wrong. But let the record show that in any age, good or bad, there are men of high ideals, men of courage, men who do more than that for which they are called upon. You will not always know their names, but let their deeds stand as monuments so that when the human race is called to judgment, we may say, this too was humanity.